Grand Rapids, in a very unique way, uh, provides for us a synthesis, a blend of things that unfortunately is all too rare uh, in our experience culturally and in this country as a whole. Uh, I think it's one of the providential reasons that the Acton Institute was founded here, because uh, our speaker, uh, Doug DeVos, is a man who blends easily his faith with his business acumen. He blends his knowledge of entrepreneurship with an incredible calling to philanthropy. He is personally committed uh, to his faith and it lives itself out both in the excellence of what he does in the marketplace and the excellence of what he does in his service to others. And so it's a particular joy to have him. Now he is no uh, you know, light touch. This guy was on the Purdue Boilermakers, which was, uh, I think, a football team or a rugby team, something tough and ugly. And, uh, and he will not live up to any of that right now. So please join me in welcoming Doug DeLong. Oh. And I forgot. I forgot. This is the, one of the problems of, in, you know, bringing Coles to Newcastle to introduce Doug DeVos to, to uh, a, a Grand Rapids audience. He also happens to be the president of the Amway Corporation. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, we'll find out how good Purdue is. We play Michigan this week in La at West Lafayette. Anybody want to put a dollar on the table, huh? <laughs> All right, yeah, yeah, I'm not doing it. <laughs> I've watched my boilers a long time. I've lost a lot of money trying, you know, I'm sticking with them. I'm a Lions fan too, so that gives you a lot of ideas about that. Uh, but uh, boy, it's a joy to be here uh, with all of you and to uh, have a chance to chat a little bit. I'm always uh, a little concerned if it, when it's called a lecture series, but I don't know if I'm a very good lecturer or not, uh, especially when I look at some of the, the, the previous topics and I know the uh, the intellectual firepower that's brought into this organization and that uh, this organization carries and, and brings out to others, uh, that, that's not me. <laughs> so, uh, and and uh, my other uh, friends at Purdue, like my professors and teachers would certainly tell you that as well as my coaches, I guess. Uh, but uh, but uh, I am honored to have the chance to just chat a little bit about some of the things that we believe in and some of the things that we feel so strongly about in Amway and uh, as a person, and, our, and, and I think many of you as well, and that is when we talk about entrepreneurialism and the entrepreneurial spirit, and when we talk about free enterprise, those are things that are just near and dear, and, and I've lived all my life, and in fact, I would, I've said to many, many people, I, I, I grew up spoiled, and I don't mean it in a financial sense. I, meant it, I, I mean it in a personal sense. I was, I was born into a family that loved me, that, that shared their faith with me and allowed it to become my own. I knew I was loved, I was a child of God, and that I had a place and a purpose in this world from the beginning, and I was surrounded by people who supported me and encouraged me, and always told me I could do something more, and I should dream a little bigger, and should move a little farther, and give it a shot. Oh, what can go wrong? So you fail, you move on, you try again. And, and so those are the sorts of things that I think we we share here and that we share in Grand Rapids in many ways that are important. And that's what I want to spend some time talking about because when I look at our story of Amway and when I look at that story of how it's played out, I think it's important to spend a little time to remind ourselves of that and, and, to, and put it in context. And some of you will have these same experiences, so I apologize if I repeat anything, but I, I have to kind of go back to what I've lived and experienced as we talk about these subjects. And, and my, my family and my kids always joke with me because no matter what happens in my life, I say, oh, it's just like Amway. <laughs> I, uh, happens in the Amway bit. Something happens in church, uh, just like Amway. We had this experience, oh, what, that, just like Amway. But let me spend a little time kind of giving you a, a basis for how we get here, or how I kind of get here, and then we can talk maybe about how it applies uh, uh, to, to some issues uh, going forward, and then we can uh, answer some questions and go from there. But you have to, for me, I have to make sure I remember the mindset that was part of the founding of our business and the mindset that was part of Dad and Jay 
uh, that, that they lived and they experienced and they brought to bear. They were children of the Depression and they served in World War II. And that Depression time period, and some of you remember what that was like and, and the challenges that that brought. I remember my father telling me the story of the fact that uh, after his father lost his job and they lost their home, they moved into the upper room, the attic area of his grandparents. And he remembers an experience of when his father answered the door, there was a young boy there selling a magazine, Liberty Magazine, only cost a dime. And he remembers his father looking at that young man and the young man was crying saying, sir, I have to sell these magazines or else I can't go home. I have to sell them all or else I can't go home. It only costs a dime. And he had to watch his father say, son, I'd love to help you, but I don't have a dime. I can't buy your magazine. And that was the same father who would always turn around to his son and say, it's gonna get better. We are not stuck in this position. Things are going to turn around someday. It's going to get better. We're going to get our home back. Life is worth living. Let's look forward to the future with confidence. What an incredible diversity in the midst of that adversity to be able to have the confidence and the faith in the future. And then there's the experience of World War II. And we, I had a time, we, a number of years ago, Dave and Andal and I got Dad and Jay in front of a video camera and just said, just start talking. And we have the video somewhere. I haven't found it again, but the boy, the memories for Dave and myself were probably even as valuable as the video. They just began to talk the fact that their whole world was threatened. They didn't, we all, in my generation, sure, of course we won, so it's pretty easy to look at it in a historical context. We didn't live it. Right, Ralph? You didn't know if you were going to win. You didn't know what was going to happen. Everything that I view in my world as stable or something like that was clearly at risk. It was clearly on the table. Would it survive or would there be a different future for the world? And those two elements kind of brought them back to say, so we were entrepreneurs. We knew in high school, when we went to Grand Rapids Christian High, and when we had our conversations together, when this war ended and we... And, the other thing we have are a lot of letters that they sent back and forth. Actually, we have the letters that Jay sent to Dad, because Jay didn't keep the letters that Dad sent to Jay, <laughs> which, which we give the Vanandals a lot of grief about. So, all right, weren't good enough for you to keep, were they? Yeah, I guess not. <laughs> and Jay would write beautifully, someday when this war ends, Richie, we're going to get in business together. Someday. And in fact, their first business together happened while my father was still overseas. It would have been easy for Jay to start on his own, but he'd made a promise. He said, we're going to get business together. I arranged through my grandfather to get some money from Dad's account to invest and to start. And one of those first businesses they started was a flight school, Wolverine Air Service. And if I'm repeating the stories, I apologize, but I think these are continue to be great stories. And I remind myself all the time that here were two guys that wanted to be in business for themselves, and they were smart enough to pick f teaching people how to fly when they didn't know how to fly themselves. <laughs> Brilliant. I mean, I, that business plan just, just falls right out there, doesn't it, huh? How can you miss that one? Hey, let's think of something we absolutely know nothing about. But it's cool. <laughs> so that's what they did. That was their first business. And then they kind of figured out that you couldn't fly all the time. There was bad weather sometimes, and you certainly couldn't fly at night. And, and so they said, well, they'll do the restaurant business. So they started the Riverside Drive-In. One night, Jay would do the tables or, or the cars, and Dad would be the cook, and then they'd switch it the other night. So it was the air service in the daytime and the restaurant at night. And Dad and Jay always said, you should all be in the restaurant business once. <laughs> That's a, you know, that's, a real, that's a real hard business. <laughs> you know, everybody wants to eat at the same time. If they could just spread it out, it would be great. But no, they all want to eat at the same time. Man, oh man. Well, they kind of went from that adventure and they picked something else that they didn't know how to do. They decided to take a boat and sail to South America. They read a book, thought it would be great. Traded an airplane, got rid of the, the air service business, bought a boat, and they were on their way. The boat had been out of the water throughout World War II and it never was really watertight. 
but they were these kind of adventurous guys. That doesn't matter. We're going to take it anyway. And they made it all the way to the coast of Cuba before it sank. <laughs> the miracle is that they made it that far because they didn't know what they were doing. But they had this entrepreneurial spirit. Someday, Richie, we're going to get in business together. Someday. And they kept going. Well, after that adventure ended, they came back, and Jay's mother's cousin was selling a product called Neutralite. 50 bucks to get in to be a Neutralite distributor. And Jay's mother's cousin loved the product. Jay's mom loved the product. Said, you boys, you want to get to a business, you should talk to him. And my dad was so enthusiastic, he said, Jay, he's your relative, you talk to him. <laughs> I'm going out. <laughs> when he came back in, Jay said, you know, this is a pretty good idea. Pat Rich, I took the money from our joint account and I gave it to him and I said we'd sign up, but I made him promise that he wouldn't cash a check until I talked to you. And he said that if you said no, we'd, he'd tear it up. He understood. And they talked into the night and they decided they'd do it. So they became Neutralite distributors. It's 1949. Selling nutritional products at a time when doctors told you you didn't need nutritional products. You eat three square meals a day, that's all you need. They were called everything but good people as they tried to move forward. But they made a decision. They went to a meeting. They heard about this. They started working it a little bit. And, and they were wondering, does this really work as they got into it? And they went to their sponsor, Jay's mother's cousin. And they said, does this really work? And he didn't give him a sales pitch. He didn't give him a big deal. He just said, well, boys, he had a good Dutch accent. Well, boys, he took out his appointment calendar and said, well, last Tuesday, I sold two boxes of double X to this person. And then in the afternoon, I sold some to this person. And then on Wednesday, I did this. And he just went through his calendar and every person that he met and every sale that he made. And he said, yeah, boys, I think, I think you can do it too. And that was it. They went to a meeting in Chicago to follow up on that, and they said, you know, see how many people show up. It was a huge meeting. Must have been 100 people. Huge in their mind. They had 100 other people to sign up in this thing. Wow. And on the way home, they said, this is it. This is what they're going to do. And they did. They started down that track for 10 years, and from that developed the Amway business started Amway in 1959, and from then it's been a heck of a ride. Neutralite and Amway are together still today. There was a, they were apart for a while there, but in the early 70s, Amway bought Neutralite, brought it back together. Neutralite's the number one selling brand of vitamins in the world. The Amway business has been successful around the world, and it was that simple entrepreneurial spirit. Yeah, boys, I think, I think you can do it too. And that took them to where they are today and where we are today. And, and I spend a little time going through that history because I think it's important that we always remember that. And we always remember the spirit behind it. And we spend a lot of time as a company talking about our, our founder's fundamentals, the values of freedom and family and hope and reward. And, and we know those stories of where that came from. And so we can look at Steve and I today and all of us in the Amway business can look and make decisions based on that foundation. We know who we are. And we can use that to address the changing environment in the marketplace that we face. It's not insignificant in my mind anyway that Amway started in 1959, same year that Fidel Castro took over Cuba. And we turned at that point from being in a neutralite business, really our cause was about helping people achieve health. And the Amway business shifted to helping people have a business of their own. And our cause became free enterprise. That the ability for people to have businesses of their own was the best way to help people around the world. And we need that today. We do a lot of work at, at Amway with Frank Luntz, upholsterer. You may be familiar with him. And one of the most striking statistics he has is that today, more people feel that it will be worse for their children than it was for them. 
Up until now, everybody, every poll, always, it was going to get better, just like my grandfather said to my dad in those tough times. It's going to get better. It's a feeling today, maybe it's not. And it's up to us to make sure that that's not the case, to make sure that it will be better, because we believe in better. We believe that we have the capacity to achieve more, to do better things together, to serve more people. And that comes from the inside out. So I'm going to give you a few thoughts of my perspective on the framework of why I believe that so strongly and some of the ideas around it. First is that I, I think belief really comes from inside. And belief, the things we hold dear to us as people, what's in our heart, what's in our soul, those are the things that come out in our actions. There's nothing worse than to hear somebody espouse one thing and do something else. If we believe in better, then we need to act like it. We need to have that confidence. And we need to express our beliefs and in many cases our faith from the inside out in what we do. I believe that business is the solution. Boy, it's tough to be in business today, isn't it? You got a target like square on I don't know, your back, your forehead, or other parts of your body. I, I don't know. Seems like built business becomes the villain. And then they all complain that there's not enough jobs. I, I don't get it. It's not that hard of a connection to make, is it? I think business is the solution. I think business has the capacity to create wealth and to help people develop economic freedom. And when they develop economic freedom, they have the opportunity to live personal freedom. Many years ago, when we opened the Amway business in Malaysia, uh, I think it was our one year anniversary. I was on the trip. I was in high school at the time. But I remember dad had the chance to meet with the prime minister of Malaysia. Pretty big deal. And as he reflected on the meeting, he said the prime minister brought up, said, you know, hey, nice to meet you. Happy, welcome to Malaysia. We're glad you're here. They went to some economic issues, and the prime minister said, you know, it's a tough economic time here in Malaysia. I don't know why you started now, but it's a tough economic time here. He said the three greatest natural resources we have in Malaysia are copper, tin, and oil. And all of those prices are, dep are depressed on the global market, and, and, and so our economy is really struggling. But yet you started here in this tough time, and, and, and your business is doing really well. What's the secret? And Dad said, well, Mr. Prime Minister, you may believe the greatest natural resources in Malaysia are copper, tin, and oil. But in Amway, we believe that the greatest natural resources of Malaysia are the people of Malaysia. And our business focuses in on people and their potential. I never found out what the Prime Minister said after that. <laughs> I, 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 you know, sometimes Dad would say things, go, did you really say that? <laughs> you gave him a lesson? Yes, he did. And our business today continues to do incredibly well. Economic freedom leads to personal freedom. Business is the answer. And if I were to stop here, it would sound a lot like I'm just another greedy capitalist, right? Put me on the poster with the rest of the Wall Street gang. But that's not the whole story. Business is not about money. Money's a tool. Business is all about people, just like Dad said. Because you and I know, and we've had a, a good friend of this organization, Arthur Brooks, taught me as well that money doesn't make you happy. You all know that. It doesn't make you happy. It'll never buy, bring happiness. And you can't take it with you. So it's got really limited value. And Arthur would tell you, earned success is what brings happiness setting a goal and working hard to achieve it. So I think those are, those, those are some of the elements that, that bring me around this when we talk about free enterprise. Let's make sure we have our perspective straight when we look at this and, and what it really means. And when we say that business is the solution and that economic is the solution, we're talking about the issues that face our world. Generally, countries that have stronger economies have less people that are hungry. Generally, countries that have stronger economies and have more economic development generally have better quality of life for their people. 
They address those issues of clean water, good food. They address the issues of poverty in a much better way. Not perfect, far from perfect, but it gains the capacity to be able to address the human issues that we face in our world. And I think that wealth creation also doesn't live by itself. It inherently generates wealth distribution, not redistribution, wealth distribution because you can turn your talents, your skills into an entrepreneurial opportunity, a job. There's a market out there. People will buy your product, your service, your idea. People will take it forward because there's economic activity. And now you have an opportunity to generate wealth for yourself because somebody else started that process. Well, so now what do we do from here? That's kind of the framework that, that it, it rattles around in my mind every night and every day. So where do we go from here? Well, there's a couple things that I'll touch on and then we can kind of go to some questions from there. I, I think what we need to do if we're gonna really unlock the potential of our community, of our state, of our country, is to unleash free enterprise. And, and I say that in the right way, because I know business isn't perfect. And, and I understand that uh, there's a lot of selfish people who would tie themselves in the business world. And I understand that the things that have gone wrong in the business world, whether it's the Enrons or the WorldComs or the Bernie Madoffs of the world or other things that have gone wrong in the financial community of late, there is a lot of selfish behavior. And those things need to be dealt with, but, and we need to have those boundaries. But we still have to unleash free enterprise in the best sense of it, because it has the best ability to help people. Sure, there needs to be boundaries. There needs to be the invisible hand that keeps us on track, and there needs to be ways to make sure we don't go off track. But we as people, as a community, should be focused on unleashing this incredible power, not to make money, but to help people. And it's right there in front of us, and so many of you do it so well, and we appreciate it. The second thing I think we need to do is we, we understand as well that we're in a framework. We have Bill and Justin here. They serve wonderfully, and bless you for doing that, by the way. I think we all are very grateful for both of you for what you do as, in serving, serving all of us and serving our country. You, you know, I think we, have, we, we need this framework. We need a government. We need a, a, a framework around us that allows us to operate or else it would be a vacuum and we wouldn't know exactly how to put the pieces together. We need that consistency. Government has a role. I believe that firmly it has a role. I just would like to have the discussion about what it should be <laughs> and what it shouldn't be. If you ever get a chance to, to come to Amway uh, and, and walk through the flag promenade that we have out front, you'll notice a number of plaques in there and it's, we have a display there called the 10 Pillars of Economic Wisdom. And it was an exhibit that Dad and Jay bought from the World's Fair that was held in New York in 1964. And it was from the Hall of Free Enterprise there. And they brought it and brought it back to Ada because they wanted it to be memorialized there and in our thinking. And when it comes to this area of government, there's a couple pieces there. Number one, and these are not, we've heard these many ways before, but I, this strikes in my mind. It's so simple. Government's never a source of goods. Everything produced is produced by people. And everything that the government gives it must first take from the people. And then the, you know, Dad talked about these things all the time in his, in, in his speeches, and he went through about who owns the tools of productivity. And, and when people own the tools of productivity, they are always far more productive, and they always create better outcomes. And as it says in the 10th pillar here, productivity has always been highest in a competitive society in which the economic decisions are made by millions of progress-seeking individuals. Rather than a state plan society in which those decisions are made by a handful of all powerful people, regardless of how well-meaning, unselfish, sincere, and intelligent those people may be. Always true. Dad gave this speech and he called it Selling America and he used Russia primarily as his main nemesis of contrasting capitalism and communism and the productivity and the quality of life in the United States against the United States against Russia. Russia is a pretty big business for us today. 
So we've had, had some, you know, kind of tone that down a little bit in recent years, you know. China's a pretty big business for us today. And I always joke sometimes when I meet with government officials, I see more capitalists with my meetings in China than I see on TV sometimes here in the United States. There's a proper role. And Justin and Bill, we're thankful for you of trying to work in the process to help it get to that proper role. We know regulations are necessary. We understand that. We understand there should be boundaries and good public policy that's in the game here. And we always are always grateful when our public officials will engage with us in the dialogue and really put people first. I think there's also wise stewardship that we need to have. And I think that's what this organization is all about. That we need to take care of these principles and we need to advocate these principles. And that when we have resources and we have a collection of people here with skills and talents and gifts, that we use them properly. And then, to me, stewardship means that we take action, that we do something about it, that it goes out from a lunch like this and it moves out in the community where we live and where we work, and that we get involved as citizens, that we get engaged in the political process because it's important to us. It's important to our country, it's important to our future. And we shouldn't be discouraged from that. We shouldn't be embarrassed about the views that we hold. We should advocate them. And I think that's part of being wise stewards. I have an opportunity to serve with the National Constitution Center in Philadelphia, and it's a beautiful facility. If you ever get there, I hope you go visit it and, and, and learn more about our Constitution. And it's right on Independence Mall, so you have in, you know, the Independence Hall at one end, and then you have the Liberty Bell, and then you have the National Constitution Center at the other. And I'm always struck, though, by the quote that Benjamin Franklin had at the time when the Constitution was finished, when the woman said, Mr. Franklin, what have you given us? And he said, a republic, if you can keep it. If you can keep it. I was given a book a, a while ago that uh, somebody, it was a book that compared corporate corporations and corporate organizations to civilizations and the fact that how they grow, how they develop, and ultimately how they die, how they get disconnected from the marketplace, how they get dis disconnected from the citizens. And, and all these great civilizations of our past are past. What went wrong? Even if they lasted for hundreds of years, Something went wrong. It's a good run, but it didn't sustain. And so often it's easy to think in our, in our environment, the United States is just going to continue on. Really? Maybe for my lifetime, maybe for my kid's lifetime. Really? It's going to just continue on without doing anything? without making sure it has a vision, without making sure it has a heart and a soul, without making sure it is living out its beliefs, it understands its founding documents. And what those words mean. And that's why organizations like this, the Acton Institute, are so critical for helping us be good stewards, be good citizens of the blessings of liberty that have showered upon us. And I think it's worthwhile committing ourselves to be those stewards and to take these actions and to take these risks, to take the entrepreneurial spirit and the ideas of free enterprise and apply them with the knowledge that they are the best way to help people that we can think of. What an opportunity we have to live out our beliefs. And then when you take a faith component and you make sure it is embedded in everything we do, now we take it to a whole new level. A whole new level of a mission and a cause and a belief system and structure that allows us to go forward in confidence. So I think that's a fight worth fighting. That's work that's worth being done. And it's an honor to be in that fight together and alongside all of you. 
Thanks, everybody. Happy to take any questions, any thoughts uh, from there. If I didn't we do have two ramble on too long, come to you with the microphone. we'll talk about the Purdue-Michigan game. <laughs> we could talk about the debates tonight. Give our opinions. Fire What's away. your perspective, Doug, on uh, a term we hear bandied about a lot lately? The term "a level playing field." Just curious, what your thoughts are on that phrase and how you see that being played out in real life. Sure, I like that phrase a lot. Give me a level playing field and a sports component and any other sort of thing. Give me the, the level playing field as long as it regards a level opportunity rather than a level outcome. Give me the same opportunity as everybody else. And if I don't win, if I don't make it, okay, somebody else was better, they got there. All I want is the same shot, the same opportunity. And if I fail, I can learn from that failure and I can figure out how to do it better. Because in, in the Amway history, guess what? We've screwed up a lot of things. And uh, we have a lot of failures. And when we look at it, we don't blame other people. We say, yeah, we, uh, yeah that was our fault. Yeah, yeah that, we did that. Yeah, that would be us. You know, in life, I do that a lot, too. And, and usually in these arguments with my wife, yeah, yeah, it's not her fault. That would be me. Yeah, OK. <laughs> um, and, and so my perspective on a level playing field is all about opportunity. And when there are people who don't have the same opportunity as other people, you bet that is work worth doing. How do we help people have the same opportunities everywhere? So all people, all God's children have the chance to rise up and to, to accomplish great things and to have the full application of their gifts and their talents to make the world better. We're missing so much when we don't give people those opportunities. But it isn't about equal results or leveling the playing field and say, well, hey, you know. I, now, sometimes I'd like to do that in basketball, right? So the Orlando Magic this year, we may not be doing so good, right? We lost Dwight Howard. And I'd love if we would have a rule in the NBA that prevented other teams from dunking a lot. <laughs> Wouldn't that be great? You know, hey, five dunks, that's all you get because we don't have Dwight Howard anymore. We can't dunk anymore. So that's what we need to do. We need to level the playing field here. How silly does it sound in a sports context. So our basket's going to be nine feet tall so our guys can dunk and so you know our field's going to be a little shorter you know. So when I sing I'll have good background vocals. <laughs> you know I mean so when, when where, where does it stop? So I, my, my perspective is it's all about opportunity and, and I think there are there are absolutely gaps in opportunities. People don't have the same opportunities and we need to work on that and improve that uh, ability. Uh, but you don't, through it, you don't do it through taking other people down. We always say it in the Amway business, too. We, we look to all the leaders, those who have been successful. It's not our job to kind of pull, hey, you, you sold too much. You're too successful and because they're the great examples. And other people can achieve those sorts of things because they all have the same opportunity in, in our business, in our context. Great. Thanks. My perspective. Non-political question. Oh, come on. <laughs> no, 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 trust me. I, we've all had enough politics right now. <laughs> the, uh, no, I, I, I am curious where you see the world going, and where do you see specifically Amway's growth potential around the world, and then sort of the changing nature of what's happening in international business? Sure. You know, it, um, you know a, a couple things. One, as you travel around the world, uh, one of the greatest challenges, and for those of you who travel internationally, is uh, CNN International. It's usually the only TV station you can get you know, in some hotels. It just drives me crazy. But that's a personal thing. Um, and, and I say that, and i got to start with that joke a little bit, because every time, oh, there's another protest against the United States. Oh, the United States did this wrong. Everything's terrible. The United States, blah, 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 blah. Everywhere I go to, the people I taught, they love the U.S. They admire, they would love to be, they would love to compare themselves, they would love to have an opportunity to live here. They can't believe the quality of life that we have, that we enjoy, and the role that we play in the world. They see that it's dramatic. And practically begging you know, business leaders from the, you know, please get your act together because if you don't have your act together, it has an impact on our lives, on our opportunity. And so it's a, it's a huge impact when you, when, when you travel around and see that. And so I, I, I kind of take it 
if you will, in a couple ways. One, I think the Amway business has been successful in a variety of different countries because we've gotten to people, just like Dad's story in Malaysia. And we've been able to connect with people. We found that people, I don't care what, you know, what your government is or what your background is or what country you live in, all that sort of stuff, if you can get to people, they're interested in opportunity. They're willing to work hard, all cultures, always. We found that all over the place. And, and so when we look to the future, we had, we're, our, our markets in all parts of the world are growing. And when they're not, we know why. We messed it up. So we, we see people are interested in opportunity. And then it just becomes those countries that say more closely aligned with free enterprise principles and make sure that that opportunity is available to more and more people in their society. Those are the countries that are going to tend to move forward. But my perspective is it's going to be really hard if the United States isn't leading. Um, because nobody can step up and fill that role. And if the United States isn't leading, there's going to be a vacuum. There's going to be a gap. Uh, and it's going to be really hard for others to break through and provide more opportunities in their countries in the ways that they want to. Uh, and I don't, I don't say that from a, from a selfish thing or thinking the U.S. is better than anybody. I just, that's just the reality of it. That, um, you know, when, when the strongest, largest, you know, the strongest economy in the world is not thriving, is not moving forward, it's really hard for everybody else to, to have a shot. And the best thing we can do, this, uh, uh, at the Econ Club uh, dinner a, a couple of years ago when Colin Powell and Madeleine Albright were here and we were talking about foreign policy, said the best thing we can do to, from a foreign policy perspective, from a security perspective, is to have a strong economy, is to take care of our debt and deficit and to take care of these sorts of issues that we're facing here. That's the best thing we can do because when America leads, everybody is, is just drawn to it. And, and, I don't, and, and I think that's in a somewhat natural way. It's about leadership in any organization, right? It's, it, when, when there's a leadership vacuum, it's really hard for people to, to feel they can be part of a, of a rising tide. Do you dare talk politics? <laughs> <laughs> well, what do sure. You think, what do you think about the presidential race and the results potentially? Well, I, I you know, I, um, I'll put it in the right track, wrong track context, you know, and I think, as I just said, leadership's important, you know, at all levels. And if you have a leader that's taking you on the wrong track or that isn't leading in a way that's strong and, uh, you know, in that context, then I think, you know, any organization is going to be in trouble. And so I would say over the past four years, we've kind of been on the wrong track and, and that we need to change. That's, you know, that's where I would, you know, come from. That's my personal, you know, view. And, um, you know, that's probably not going too far because I have a Romney sticker on the back of my car. So, <laughs> you know, I, I'm, I'm happy to say those sorts of things, but that's my personal expression, you know, and, and I, I hope everybody uh, has their own personal expression uh, and is engaged as a citizen and looks at the issues and, and makes their own decision. And, and that's, what I, uh, that's what I am more, uh, you know, more interested in is that everybody's engaged and makes, makes their own decision. I, then I kind of go to the Constitution and say, well, if that's what the votes are, then that's what the votes are, and we'll go from there. Can you give us a little bit of perspective on education and how it plays into the entrepreneurial spirit in the United States? Well, I think, uh, you know, that goes back to the opportunity question, the level playing field question. You know, education is absolutely a critical element. And it's just a travesty that there are some people in our country or around the world that, that have an opportunity for good quality education. There are others that don't. And, uh, and that the service isn't being provided in a high level quality way for everybody. You know, from a marketplace standpoint, right, we, we, we do our best to get high quality, high value products to the marketplace and that everybody can make a choice about what they get. And we're competing with a lot of people who are really trying to make sure that the, the customer, the consumer is, is getting that product, that service delivered to them at the highest value, at the highest quality. And then I look at our educational system and I see incredibly dedicated people. Uh, in many aspects, in many ways. And, and one of the things is we've gotten close to it, wow, there are some unbelievably dedicated people in the system, administrators, teachers, parents, volunteers. Uh, but clearly it's a system that, that where, where the leadership isn't always aligned around making sure that the end product is the absolute best it can be. And uh, so there's pockets of, of good things and there's pockets of failure. And uh, you know, as, a, you know, as a community, one of the biggest things I think we can focus on because that's our future. 
It's our kids, it's our next generation of making sure that everybody has that same opportunity uh, to, to achieve and, and to, uh, you know, to achieve the God-given talents and to be able to express the God-given talents that they have. Uh, I've become involved, in, and if you take it not just K-12, but take it down to you know, um, early child, you know, I'm involved with the first steps, the early childhood uh, commission here uh, locally, and you know, all the research, all the studies shows when, you know, that the development of a child starts right after birth, and those are the most critical years. And if we don't pay attention there, then, then there's immediately going to be a gap. There's immediately going to be a gap in opportunity that's going to be available to this child. And let's start filling that gap. Let's start making, that, making sure that every child uh, has that opportunity. But it's critical to our future uh, you know, as, a, as a city, as a community, uh, and, and as a nation. And it's not, you know, I, I don't think, and I'd say the same thing in a lot of the Amway context, it's not just throwing money at the problem. Uh, there's a lot of things, and there's a lot of things we say at the Amway too. So there's plenty of money here. We're just not doing it right. And throwing more money at it's just going to make us do it more wrong. Is that good English? Uh, you know, maybe I need to go back to school. You, you know, um, and, and so that's a, that's just an easy argument to have in a political sense, rather than getting down to saying it, it's absolutely critical to to be able to provide that. And I think you know, I, I think that a, a competitive marketplace in that arena. Is helpful, you know. If uh, if anybody has a monopoly, uh, it's going to be hard to really listen to the voice of the customer, uh, whether that's the student or the community. Um, but when you're in a, a competitive situation and you may not exist a, as an institution uh, because you're not listening to the voice of the customer, then maybe that'll make you listen a little bit better. Doug, you just mentioned monopoly. And the thought occurred to me at Acton, one of the threats we see to free enterprise is what we term crony capitalism. Mm -hmm. uh, and so what are we to do with maybe your peers who go to, rather than compete with you, may go to government to secure special favors and monopolies to help you or to, to hurt you, your competition? Sure. Well, we ask for a level playing field. Give us the same opportunity. And, and that shouldn't happen. You know, those sorts of things, you know. Uh, you know, government, if we go back to our role discussion, you're not in the business of picking winners or looters. That's not what we asked you to do. I didn't see that in the Constitution. By the way, pick some things that you think are cool and invest in them. Pay, take taxpayer money and go do that. You know, I didn't see that there. I, I don't know where that is, but yet it happens on a regular basis. And why should others be protected and, you know, one segment carved out, whether it's one uh, sector of the economy versus another sector of the economy or one company that's got an in versus something else. Uh, so all, all we do in our government affairs pieces, we connect whether it's the Chamber of Commerce or whether it's uh, the Direct Selling Association, we go in as organizations and associations and say, what's, what's, you know, and we try to offer, here's what we think is the best way to regulate our industry so that the consumers are protected and they get the highest value from what we're doing. Um, but the crony capitalism thing just drives you absolutely crazy. It just shouldn't happen. Huge problem. Did you hear me? Yeah, student debt. Yeah, you know, you know, like anything, it's uh, you know, you better have a plan for how you're going to financially support what you want to do, and whether it's buying a house or whether it's getting an education, that you know, taking the rent, the cost, and your ability to pay back the debt is something that you have, you know, that you have to, you have to be able to, you know, accomplish. Um, so I, I, I don't. You know, dive into it specifically with you know, regard to student loans or student debt like that. But I just think in the big picture, you know, we we've taken a decision. Dad and Jay were pretty. You know, I I had a uh, fun lunch a couple years ago with my dad and Fred Meyer, um, and uh, I, I, we were talking about Grand Valley State. But the conversation quickly went to the history of Grand Rapids and a lot of fun old stories. And you know what they spent a lot of time talking about? Banks that won't loan them money. <laughs> when they were getting started, they spent a lot of. They they remembered names, they remembered amounts, they remembered people, <laughs> they remembered all that sort of stuff. But certainly, uh, I, I I know with uh, with Dad and Jay, uh, paying attention to their financial strength as a company was vitally important. They didn't spend what they didn't have, and if we if we did have to. Uh, engage in borrowing in any way for whatever reason throughout our history, there was always a very well thought out plan about how we were going to get out of it. Uh, um, uh, 
Warren Buffett had a great illustration about debt. It says like you're driving down the road and there's an ice pick coming out of your steering wheel and pointed right at your heart. And the more debt you have, the longer and sharper that ice pick is. You know, so you better think about that before you dive into it too deep. Okay, a couple more. Doug, uh, has Amway uh, broken into any of the Muslim countries? Yes, we have. Indonesia, Malaysia has a, a large Muslim population. India, we operate in India. Uh, and really, the, you know, the Amway business, um, you know, as, when we stay focused on economic issues and we talk, stay focused on economic opportunity, uh, we cross an amazing number of boundaries. And we have people from all different faiths. Uh, and we're in Turkey. We operate in Turkey as well. And so we have people from all different faiths um, sitting around the table laughing and joking with one another, celebrating, cheering for other people's success. And a couple examples probably are best out of Turkey, where you know, a couple uh, at a table like this, you know, two couples are very strict Muslim couples, very you know, just wonderful folks. Other folks from Turkey were you know, educated in, you know, in Paris, so she's got the latest hairstyles, the latest gowns, all the sorts of different. Great friends talking to each other about the commonalities that they express or that they find in the Amway business. And uh, uh, another one was uh, at an Amway meeting. You know, it's pretty interesting to see, you know, somebody gets introduced and the, the crowd kind of stands and cheers for them. And I turned around and saw a woman with a, with a burqa and her fingers in her mouth whistling and cheering. <laughs> and, and I thought, well, that's something new I haven't seen before. And, uh, but what a joy, it, you know, and that, I mean, economic opportunity brings people together. It doesn't divide people. You know, everyone wants to, you know, we found, everyone wants to, so when we talk about freedom, family, hope, and reward, you know, everyone wants to be free. We found out, we did, yeah, everyone likes that concept, that idea. Everyone cares about their family and a better life for themselves and their family and for their future, right? Everyone hopes for the future. Everyone, everyone wants to be rewarded for work well done. Those are values that, that touch you know, it doesn't matter what culture, what faith, what any background. Those are things that brings people bring people together. That's been our experience. Right, great. Last question here, Scott. Yeah, that was pretty much what my question was going to be. You touched on faith earlier, mm -hmm. and do you see those uh, small business owners around the world living their faith strongly as your family does, and many of your other uh, businesses here in the United States? Sure, everyone does according to their own beliefs. You know, we have um, we haven't been shy about our personal beliefs. We don't we don't. Uh, it's certainly not a condition you know, to to be in the Amway business as a uh, as a distributor, independent business owner, or as an employee in any way, shape, or form. Um, but you know, we haven't been shy, and, and we you know we think you know, like I was saying earlier, that when you have your faith, the things that you believe should come out in actions, and the things that you do when you live and when you are a citizen, when you're active in your community. That it's an expression of, uh, of what you believe and who you are inside. And um, so we have many who uh, express their faith in a variety of ways. You know, with many, like I said, virtually every faith uh, you know, is represented in the Amway business today. Uh, and people live out their faith. And, and then there's others who, who we know very much don't have a faith. And, um, and, and we see you know, that element as well. Uh, and if anything, maybe we can just surround them and put them in an environment, and maybe someday they'll see something different and make a decision for themselves, uh, whatever, that, whatever that may be. Oh, great. Please join me in thanking Doug DeVos. Great. Thanks, everybody.